Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle, and I am joined with my co-hosts, Michael Hall and Michael Reed. But we are joined for the first time ever by former Washington defensive back and Raiders defensive back, but also the current game day radio host, Mr. D'Angelo Hall. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, D'Angelo. How are you doing on this beautiful Victory Monday? Oh, man, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I actually left Vegas and went right to Orlando. Um, my 10-year-olds are playing in the national championship with their football team um, out of Manassas. So I'm enjoying football right now. Coming off a win from, from Washington, and we got a win the other day, and we're, you know, we're still playing. So everything's nice. You go from one nice, set of winners nice, to another nice. set of winners, Mr. <laughs> Hall. I, I see how you do it there. My first question to you, sir, what was more surprising to you? Was it the lack of points from Washington going against that Las Vegas defense, or was it the Las Vegas' offense not being able to put up many points on this defense? I mean, I think it was a combination of both, right? I think defensively, you probably thought you had an opportunity to make some plays in the secondary, um, you know, against that Raiders defense that you really didn't see come to fruition, especially after that first drive, right? You saw Washington just march down the football field. So you thought, man, this is going to be an easy game. But, you know, as we've seen with the NFL, it's, you know, it, it's not easy. Week after week, teams we think are going to win, loses, and vice versa. And so, you know, it's, 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 any, it's anybody's guess at this point. And right now, the way we're playing football these last five games are coming down to us playing Dallas twice, us playing Philly twice, and the Giants. I like, I like our chances, 100%. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Uh, who would have thought, like, going back a month ago that this team would be 500, playing 500 ball right now, controlling their own <laughs> destiny down the stretch pretty much? And speaking of controlling yeah. their own destiny down the stretch, like you just mentioned, the five, uh, the five um, division games coming up, we're the sixth seed in the playoffs right now. That's all because of pretty much this uh, this run game with Antonio Gibson and Scott Turner dialing up great plays. Um, how impressed are you with Antonio Gibson, especially with the first half of the season? He was dealing with the injury, got to the bye week. He seems like he came out a whole new person. Yeah, I mean, hell, I've been extremely impressed with AG. Um, you know, just watching the transition from, from full-time receiving in college to kind of, you know, full-time back and now being that lead dog for this Washington offense. I mean, this dude's 230-pound back that I think a lot of people don't give him credit for being such a physical runner. Um, but, I mean, you know, hats off to this offensive line. You know, no matter who's been hurt, no matter who's out there, they just continue to mow guys down, man. And I love what Scott Turner's doing with some of these zone runs, um, kind of hitting on the outside, giving his offensive linemen, um, you know, the ability to get some angles on some of these blocks. And, man, it's really paid off. So, um, you know, just – Extremely impressed. You know, I wasn't thinking that we were going to be a running football team like we've been, been able to do. Uh, but I tell you what, I take these wins any way we can get them. And, you know, like you said, AG's been balling out of control. Yeah, especially, I mean, props to AG, too, for starting to get his fumbling under control. That, that issue, that was huge. And uh, he yeah, seemed to have it that's, that was under control issue. right yeah. now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but, hey, you worked on it, man. That's my guy. So it's something that you know about probably better than anybody is cornerback play. I was super high on William Jackson the third coming into the season. I was convinced he was going to be a top three cornerback in the NFL. What is something that you have seen from him that uh, really should make fans excited? Because he seems to be playing a lot better over the last few games. Yeah, I mean the whole defense in general was playing a lot better. You know, I think I think Jack Del Rio's you know starting to get a feel for for what guys are comfortable doing, and sometimes it takes some time. I know we all. You know, we all live in a live in a society where we want results immediately. I know myself included. Sometimes I forget what it's like to be in that locker room and understand the process and how, you know, no matter after a loss is never as bad as you think, after a win, you're never as great as you think. You know, it's really it's really humbling yourself and understanding that it, it is a process. And, you know, watching William Jackson, I didn't know a whole lot about him, um, you know, in Cincinnati. Uh, you know, but everybody I talked to told me just how of a student of the game he was, how such a great press man to man corner. And so, um, you know, just watching his defense kind of evolve, playing a little more man to man, letting William Jackson kind of get down there and press some guys. You know, I think him and his secondary is just starting to get a little bit more comfortable, starting to gel together. Um, you know, and it takes time. You know, it takes time when you're rotating so many different guys and different packages. Um, you know, it takes time sometimes just to just to get on the same page. And even in this last game in Vegas. Um, you know, with no landing Collins, you saw Khalid Hudson in a different role. 
Um, you saw a little bit more Danny Johnson. You saw Cam Curl playing a little bit more of a different role, kind of that Landon Collins role. Um, so, you know, it's just really getting that time and that chemistry with all those guys collectively um, that ultimately when it comes playoff time and down the stretch is how these guys are gelling, how they're communicating, um, and how Jack Del Rio chooses to use them. Yeah, and the Burgundy Zone is part of the Frederick Podcast Network. You can find out more at www.listenfrederick.com. Now, Mr. Hall, a fellow Hokie, Virginia Tech Hokie, Mr. Brian Johnson, 22 years old. The game, of course, in Vegas, the must-win game for the Washington football team, comes down to his leg. What are you thinking in the booth calling that game with Bram Weinstein and Julie Donaldson as that kick is coming up as a Hokie? As a fellow Hokie, you had to be confident, right? I kind of feel bad because I didn't need – I knew Joey Sly got hurt. Joey Sly was my guy. I, I know Joey Sly. I didn't even know Brian Johnson went to Virginia Tech, to be honest. And then we got to talk, and I'm like, oh, man, well, heck, yeah, he's going to make that kick. He's a hope. Um, but just extremely, you know, extremely excited for him, you know, to step into that kind of role, especially after a guy like Chris Blewett came in here, um, you know, and missed some kicks initially. Uh, you know, kind of didn't know what to expect, right? Um, but just – Extremely impressed. You know, he, he he proved himself. He went out there. He won the game. You know, we saw him in pregames, uh, you know, pregame warm-ups, kicking him from, from, from 58, 59 yards. So we kind of mm-hmm. knew he could get the ball there. It was just about the nerves and how he would feel, you know, in, you know, what do they call that place? Uh, uh, the Death Star or something. The Black they call Hole. The Black Vegas Hole. In the atmosphere. Yeah, it was, it was bananas in that stadium. And so to see him kind of – you know, settle the nerves and just go out there and kick the football right through, man. It it, it gave you a whole lot of confidence that, that, that he can make plays in this league. Yeah, definitely. And we're going to need that kicker down the stretch. Yeah, you know, heck these yeah. division games coming up. And uh, going back to what you said a little bit ago about how you um you got to, like, trust the process in the, throughout the season, kind of, like, go with the flows of the season up and down, and uh, how – some, most fans kind of want like a microwave society where they want inst- instant results right away. Well, a guy like Jamin Davis came in at the 19th pick overall. He's kind of had a slow tar- start to the season, but you've seen him come on towards the middle of the season now down the stretch. What have you seen for him so far, and what do you think his ceiling can be going forward? I mean, you see the comfort level. You know, you see him starting to get a little bit more comfortable doing different things. And like I said, you're even seeing, I mean, you're even seeing Jack Del Rio use some different ways. I remember several times in the game, um, we went down to like a five down lineman set where he was one of the he was one of the defensive ends rushing, you know, kind of putting a little more speed out there. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's undeniable that the dude can play football. Um, he's a little bit raw from a standpoint of he didn't play a lot of middle linebacker in college. And so, you know, you take the inexperience of playing a position and then you magnify that by putting him on this stage in the National Football League. I mean, I played with a guy in London Fletcher who, I mean, was one of the best I ever seen do it. And I know how hard it was for him and, you know, just the conversations we had, you know, me having to work with him in certain situations when I was playing some of that nickel. Um, I mean, it's hard when you talk about those run gaps and where to be in your drops and things like that and the communication with motions, um, you know, so it, it is a process and I understand that, but you, you, you do see the flashes from Jamin Davis. Um, you know, I know everybody wants him to go out there and be, be uh, Michael Parsons, um, and heck, I do too. But, um, you know, sometimes it just takes a little bit more time. Like I said, Michael Parsons was a dude from day one. Um, you know, he was down there playing at Penn State. So he has a lot more snaps at those middle linebacker positions and things like that to try to diagnose some some, uh, some of those looks. Yeah. Um, but I'm looking forward to watching Jamin, man. Like like I said, Jamin always makes a couple splash, splash plays that you're like, man, you know, when he knows what he's doing, he's going to be hell. It's when he doesn't that you can kind of see him, you know, moving a little bit slower then you would like him to move. Um, but, you know, I'm optimistic that this that this dude is going to be a star. You know, they're going to find a way to use him. You got two linebackers when you talk about Ron Rivera and Jack Del Rio. Uh, if those two guys can't develop a middle linebacker, we got a problem. So I got all the confidence in the world that they're going to they get it figured out. Yeah, yeah. So as you've mentioned, this team has been rolling lately. Uh, they've got some very important games coming up down the stretch. This is unprecedented. Five division games to close out the season. Uh, they faced the first place get Dallas Cowboys twice, uh, but they've had some huge wins already. I mean, they beat the defending Super Bowl champion, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. What do you think the feeling is like in that locker room right now? And do you think that this guy, these guys are just, they are through their through the roofs right now? With well, confidence? I mean, you know, with anything, confidence makes you feel like you can do anything. Um, you know, I used to tell young coaches that all the time, like Sean McVay, Matt LaFleur, you know, all these young coaches that I was around and had the opportunity to be around, 
Um, I told him that's the number one thing, man. If you can give a guy confidence, a player confidence, no matter what position he plays, you can put him in position to make plays. He's going to feel like he's unstoppable. And that's what you're seeing from this, from this football team, man. I, you know, these four, these four wins in a row, they feel as though they're unstoppable. Um, you know, having won seven in a row, you never feel like, you know, when we were at like win five and six, we felt like, man, it don't matter who you bring in this stadium or where we got to go, we're going to take care of business. And like I said, you're seeing you're seeing that. And I love what Coach Rivera is doing with the whole David and Goliath thing and pulling the rock out and them throwing it against the wall <laughs> because that's who they feel like they are. They feel like they're David and no one's, you know, rooting for them. Everybody's expecting them to lose. And they're knocking off these Goliaths that people have picked to be, you know, to be champions. Like that game against the Bucks, I think that was the first game that you saw Ron kind of pull that rock out. And from there, it's just continued to snowball and the momentum's going. And, you know, like I said, these guys are getting that confidence and they're, you know, they're feeling it unstoppable out there. Yeah, and I have a two-part question for you, uh, Mr. Yeah. Hall. First one being is um, the Bobby McCain non-flag. Everyone goes back to it because Washington won 17-15. That was a big play to end the football game. If that was completed, that would have been an easy chip shot field goal. What did you think on that play? Because you being a former DB, you kind of know what Bobby McCain is thinking in that aspect. Then the vice versa off of that, Logan Thomas, what did you think of his injury in the play that transpired? I mean, I love Logan Thomas. You know, the, the, that catch he made where he went up there, I told somebody, look like an alley-oop. Yeah. yeah. Like, they just pulled my alley-oop, and he went and got it. He's going to be a huge loss, especially with Ricky Seals. Uh, Ricky Seals Jones being injured right now as well. That's going to be a huge loss. Um, but it's always been next man up. You know, they played without Logan for a number of weeks um, and have still been able to get it done. It's going to be a big, big loss. But, you know, I feel confident that we'll be able, um, you know, to still make plays offensively. You know, the Bobby McCain play, you know, as a DB, I, I never want to see pass interference. Um, I did think Bobby pulled on him a little bit, but I didn't think it obstructed Zay's opportunity to go get that football. I thought Zay still had a chance to catch that ball. I think it did hit his hands, and he just dropped yeah, he it. Almost caught um, it yeah. As a DB, though, you don't expect the team to take that shot. Like, I'm in the booth like, wow. Like, that's a hell of a play call because I'm not playing for that. Like, I'm playing for everything but a shot. And they call that shot versus, I think, a cover two look that they end up getting one on one. But thank goodness Bobby McCain was a former corner and he understands what it feels like to have that ball in the air. Some corners get to pulling you down and safeties get to pulling you down um, and panic a little bit. So it was nice, like I said. It was a little bit of contact, but I've seen a lot more call. I've seen a lot less calls. So I can understand why Raider fans are a little bit pissed off, but they mm -hmm. should be extremely happy. They got a lot of calls, I think, the week before, if I'm not mistaken. So they'll be all right. Yeah, to wrap this up, <laughs> Mr. Hall, I got only a couple more questions for you. And we'll, we can go rapid fire here if that's okay. But Washington has won four, four in a row. You know, they are on fire. You calling the games in the booth, you get to see this team at a detailed, very intimate level. What is the difference between now and the beginning of the season? You know, I think it's the confidence. Um, you know, I think this team's playing with a little bit of a chip on their shoulder. I think they expect to be really damn good. Um, and it just didn't happen early on. They played some dynamic quarterbacks. Um, and it just wasn't clicking. And I think sometimes when you don't have really great players, um, you know, not having Montez, not having Chase, it makes you elevate your game. I mean, you have to, right? If, mm. if, if, if Cole's out there and he doesn't have Shaq and he doesn't have all these other guys, He's going to try to go for a hundred, right? If he has those guys, yes, he can lean on them. But if you don't, you got to go to you got to go to battle with the guys you got. And you know, you've seen guys on the outside, um, you know, make plays. You've seen guys in the middle step up. You've seen Jack call a little more blitzes, a little more pressure, um, you know, to kind of fabricate some of that rush. Um, and it's been working great. Guys have been locked in on the coverage on the back end. You know, I didn't like Cole Holcomb was stuck in some coverage a couple times that I probably wouldn't have put him in that position. Mm. Um, but when you get aggressive sometimes, you know, sometimes you're not going to always like the matchup you get left with. But like I said, it, it's, it's a cat and mouse game and it's chess. So, um, you know, we're playing some damn good chess right now. And the last one, Mr. Hall, I can't. we can't leave this interview without talking about it. It's Dallas week. It's a huge week for Washington football. Four games straight. And also, there is a Toys for Tots uh, thing going on, event going down at FedEx Field this weekend for the Dallas game. If you'd like to talk about that on top of it. But going into this Dallas matchup, how do you like their chances? I mean, Dallas is a <laughs> Dallas is an explosive offense with a really good quarterback, really good run game. You know, they can throw it around the place. A defense that's much improved. 
Um, I mean, it's going to take it's, it's going to take Washington's best effort. And I've always said that, you know, with Washington is about how consistent can they be? Um, can they consistently go out there and run the football? Can they consistently stop a team from running it? Can they not give up the big play? Um, and this is going to be a challenge that, you know, to me, I think it's going to be one on the outside. It, it's not necessarily going to be about how physical can you be. It's going to be, can you cover C.D. Lamb? Can you cover Mark Hooper, Michael Gallup, Cedric Wilson? All these pass catches they got with Dak Prescott throwing the football, it's going to put a lot of pressure on his defense. And so to me, um, you know, my eyes are going to be glued on this, um, you know, on this defense and how Jack Del Rio, you know, kind of has some answers for the young whippersnapper and Kellen Moore, that play mm -hmm. caller. Yeah, absolutely. Mr. Hall, I can't thank you and enough. I'm sorry, uh, uh, Torres for Tots. You're good. Well, no, I was just going to mention Torres for Tots, man. It's a great, great organization. Washington always does a whole lot to give back. Um, excited to be a part of it. Anybody who's coming out, please bring a toy, unwrapped toy, drop it off. Um, I know a lot of the youth would definitely um, be appreciative of that. So yeah. if anybody's out there listening, please, if you're coming to the game, drop, a, bring a toy, drop it off. Absolutely. And I can't thank you so much, Mr. Hall, for bringing that up because I, I almost forgot right after I asked you. But I'm going to be there this weekend. I'm bringing a toy to drop off. Make sure you all do too. Fellow Hokey, thank all you right. so much for joining us, Mr. Hall. I've been watching you since I was a kid. I got to watch you back at Lane yes, Stadium. Sir. It's been a blessing to be able to watch you at FedEx Field, at Lane Stadium, and now in the booth as well. I can't thank you enough for the time. It's a dream come true for me, Mr. Hall. I can't thank you enough. Have a great night, sir. Uh, I appreciate it. Let's have a good night, too. Hey, you have a good appreciate one, sir. Good Hope one, you man. guys get the W. All right. All right, everybody. No we doubt. just spoke Thanks. with the man, Mr. D. Hall. I mean, dude, that was absolutely awesome. I wanted to tell him that, like, every time he made a play back in, like, the day and, like, the hard times days when we go to the bar and watch the games, I would get up and run around every time he made a play. Like, That's my seventh cousin. That's my seventh cousin. <laughs> that is hysterical. I wanted to ask him how easy it was to intercept Jay Cutler. With that. Four like, times. Yeah, let's not throw any more dirt on that, dude. Uh, maybe, but, like, uh, Daddy's probably... got to get back to work. I'm All right, like, Reed. Yes. It was a pleasure, sir. And before you get out of here, right. let's let's go into a little bit of a Manscaped, Dad. You know, we got some holidays coming up. Maybe some gift ideas for you guys. Let's check it out. Ho, 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 gentlemen. Just like myself, the holidays came early here at Manscaped, the leading men's hygiene brand. Manscaped just launched new products, including their new ultra premium body wash and two-in-one shampoo and conditioner. Everyone likes a two-for-one deal. It's time to give yourself, or someone who needs it, the gift of beautiful skin, hair, and balls this holiday season. Go to manscaped.com and use the code BURGANYZONE for 20% off plus free shipping. All right, everybody, and welcome back to the show. I mean, that was fantastic. You know, I, as a Hokies fan, I absolutely loved to be able to see that. But that first off being Washington, they have won. They won 17 to 15. They've done that two weeks in a row, by the way. They did that last crazy. week as well. I know, crazy numbers to, to even say that. Uh, but <laughs> <Right>. the fact <laughs> is, that was a crazy win. Uh, we talked about it with Kevin, who's a Raiders fan, on Friday. And how much of a tall task it was for Washington, because offensively, you know, they go to their strength uh, weaknesses on defense with passing the football. And this was a big test being able to say, yeah, you can stop the run, but can you stop the pass enough to be able to put yourself in a position to win? And I told Cracky, uh, Kevin on Friday, I thought it was going to be a low scoring game. And that turned out to be what it was. I mean, I was blown away with how this team pulled that out. Yeah, no, you guys were, I think uh, Kevin said it was going to be a low scoring game as well. You guys were spot on with it. Um, definitely. I love how, once again, they kind of controlled the clock. Ran the ball, pounded with AG. Uh, your mic went out, Hall. It's okay. It's fine. But let's go on to our next question. And this is going to be from the Colonel himself. So we're going to talk to him. Let's see what he wants us to talk about today. And the first one is, how nutty is it to, to suggest that we go after Gardner Minshew as Heineke's backup and use all of our draft value for other gems like Cameron Curl Hall? Uh, what was the beginning of the question? All I heard was Gardner Minshew and backup. How crazy is it to think that we should bring in Gardner Minshew to be Taylor's backup and then use all of our draft assets for players like Cam Curl? Um, I mean, in theory, that sounds good, but I kind of look at as Gardner Minshew as like a little bit lesser Taylor Heineke, or maybe they're the same person at this point. And at this point, you also have Kyle Allen. I don't know if they're going to bring him back or not. Um. I still think they're going to go forward as far as like the, this, this upcoming draft. I don't think it might be, it might not be a first round quarterback, might not be a second round quarterback, but I do think they're going to take a quarterback 
at some point in the draft and have him sit behind Taylor, see if he can pick up the offense and sit and uh, pick up something behind Taylor. But, I mean, like I said, in theory, I wouldn't say it's crazy, but I don't think that's going to be in the plans. So, yeah. I, I think I don't I'm not going to say it's crazy because right now Philly has their own issues going on. Uh, they ha- it seems like they have their own little infighting uh, going with the quarterback competition. They're saying, oh, it's not a competition. But every time that you have to answer that question and say that there's a quarterback competition going on. Exactly. And we know that all too well here in Washington about quarterback competitions because we've seen it hand in hand so many times over. Um, but I, I don't think it's that crazy, Colonel. But I will say. I would rather go down the Young Avenue route. Um, I would love to have Taylor here, of course. Um, I think Taylor has shown that consistency, but it needs to continue. We got five games coming up, the hardest part of the stretch. It's great that we went on a four-game streak, but that all goes away with five games left and you lose five straight. You know, that all gets washed out. You got to continue to move, got to continue to do well. Now, the next question from the Colonel Hall is pertaining to the tight end position, and he wants to know, are we just snake bit with our number one tight ends? First Jordan Reed, now Logan Thomas, have both been uber talented, but both also super injured. Have we put enough emphasis on the position depth wise? Um. Well, first of all, hopefully we got a little bit of great news today. Logan didn't tear his ACL, so yep. they think they're going to do more tests. So hopefully, uh, even if he's not back this year, it's going to be lo- way less of a rehab going forward. And hopefully by early 2022, he'll be back on the field. But as far as the depth as far for the tight end position, I mean, look, they drafted John Bates. I think, uh, what did someone say? I think he was the sixth best, the sixth tight end taken in that draft. And I'm not going to say he's the best because you got guys like Kyle Pitts and stuff like that. But it turns out that this guy's come pretty much like an, uh, an uncovered gem that they found in the draft. He has great hands. Obviously, people have been talking about his blocking since he got into the building. He's a great blocker. So I definitely think that uh, – you would love to have a guy like Logan Thomas, even Ricky Seals Jones, who's a pretty athletic tight end guy type of guy. But I have faith that a guy like John Bates, who's coming into his own as a rookie, can go out there, have a great blocking performance, and add a couple catches in the passing game as well. Yeah. And now we are joined by another guest, returning guest, Mr. Scott Jackson, who is the host of the Washington Football Team's official post game show. Thank you so much for joining us on this victory Monday, Mr. Jackson. How are you doing? Good. How you guys been? Uh, good, fantastic good, good. for this whole month it seems like four, yeah, in a, no. four in a row this Washington team and I saw a little bit uh, by our guy Zach on Twitter and in the last four games Taylor Heineke has completed 70% of his passes how great was he yesterday I know the interception was kind of tipped Max Crosby was throwing was gotten away tipped it away but besides that throw how great was Taylor Heineke yesterday yeah, I mean, I think he did some good things yesterday. I mean, I think there's still, you know, some situations you'd like him to get better at, maybe throw a little with more anticipation. Look, he doesn't have the biggest arm. I think everybody understands that, you know, and I think he's got to throw with more anticipation and, and sometimes holds it a little long. I mean, that Gibson touchdown, I was getting a little worried. I mean, I saw Gibson <laughs> wide open on my TV set. I'm like, oh, dude, just yeah. throw it, throw yeah. it, throw it. And he did um, eventually. But, you know, and then let's be honest. I mean, the Logan Thomas catch was an incredible catch. But if that's one of those ones, if you miss it, you're kicking yourself in the ass for the rest of the week, you know, I mean, uh, about that. So, I mean, you know, his his thing has been, and he hadn't been doing it much until yesterday, I didn't think, uh, was throwing high a lot. Like, when he goes wide, and that's dangerous, obviously, uh, and he gets a little high with his throws. Now, look, they've got more tape on this guy than ever before now because they've, you know, he's finally playing. So I think part of it too is, you know, the Raiders did a really good job. First of all, they have two really good ends. I mean, let's get that out of the way. Um, you know, despite their other deficiencies in that defense. And they did a good job, him and him in. Like he couldn't, you know, he couldn't break out as the way he wanted to. You know, there weren't the running lanes that you, you've seen him uh, go after before. And I, I think uh, they, did, they had a good plan for him. So And they locked down Terry was, McLaurin too, his number, the yes. only, basically the only option besides the right. running back. No, they, they locked him down, they did a good job. You know, yeah. and look, I mean, Logan was running, you know, had, it was open yesterday. They got it to him uh, before the injury. Um, and, you know, they did some other good things. And obviously not having JD is, is different. And, yeah. and cl- clearly Curtis Samuel is not, you know, even close to where he needs to be yet. So that, that's what's going to be interesting moving forward. Hopefully McKissick gets back because I think, you know, with this Dallas game, <laughs> they could really use him. Um, and then, you know, whatever they get from Samuel's kind of bonus. I still don't think there's enough Cam Sims in that offense. I don't, I don't know. I agree. What I got to do to make that happen. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I just think, you know, him and Taylor had a good, had a good rapport last year. Um, and he's a bigger receiver, you know, and, and especially if you're going to be without Logan, which it appears they're going to be um you know for the rest of the way i mean you, he's the kind of guy you know you need a bigger body out there um you know that can uh, you know can also stretch the field too you're right right 
Yeah, and looking forward, uh, looking ahead to this game on Sunday against obviously one of our biggest rivals, the division rival, the Dallas Cowboys. Um, they're the favorite coming in here. I think it's four and a half or something like that right now, as yeah. it should be. They're a better team, or they're playing as a better team right now, at least. Um, looking forward, this team has been dominating. Washington it is has been dominating the possession, the uh, time of possession, running the ball like crazy, which has been opening up the uh, the downfield stuff for Terry McLaurin and guys like that. Thirty three minutes last gonna, night. Yeah, it was a little bit closer than it has been usually, but yeah. it's still still favored them. Do you think they're going to be able to keep that up against Dallas, who has a guy like Michael Parsons, a guy like Trayvon Diggs on the other side of the ball? Oh, they're going to have to try to. I mean, you're going to have to impose your will on them. I mean, that's what they want to do. I mean, I think you want to make it a, a rock fight. I mean, this is what they've done well since the bye week. I mean, they've just, you know, they've muddied it up. They get, become the more physical team in all their games. They've been more physical. Uh, they've, you know, overcome some shortcomings, um, you know, because of the physicality on both lines. And I, and I think, yeah, I mean, look, this week was a tough ask, the, the, the Oakland game or, excuse me, the Las Vegas game because of the short week and everything. Um, and obviously, you know, they handled it well going west. And, you know, hopefully they get some, some fresh bodies back uh, this week to help them out. But, yeah, I mean, absolutely. You got you to run it. Uh, hopefully Schweitzer can play. Um, that would help them for sure. Um, you know, and, and obviously now, you know, Keith Ishmael can play if you need him mm-hmm. to, which is, which is great to know. Uh, but, again, you'd rather have your, be- your better guys, you know, out there and so you have some of that depth. But, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I'm, you're going to want a lot of Gibson. You, he's going to have to hit 20 to 25 touches again. Uh, you're going to have to, like I said, uh, really, you know, just try to impose your will and keep Prescott and that those receivers on the sideline. And I, I think the one encouraging thing watching Dallas is, you know, I, I don't think the run through Dak Prescott seems to be in play right now. Maybe he's been saving it all year. I don't know for, for these special games, but he, he hasn't shown it. Um, the Saints have some fast ends, obviously, and fast linebackers, and they were able to track him down pretty easily. He couldn't get away from guys when he did try to scramble. Uh, watching that game on Thursday and just I've noticed it all year he's been hesitant to run and I, hey I don't blame him I mean that's how he got hurt last year was it was in a scramble play so it makes sense and you know it's a serious surgery he went through so um, you know I think uh, you know Dallas they were they were great out of the gates but I think the thing that's hurt them they don't have the roster depth that they need to have right like they have a lot of really good top line players like CeeDee Lamb's a stud you know, Cooper is really good, but you see like when those guys are out, like there's a big drop off, not to say if Washington didn't have Terry McClure, there'd be, wouldn't be a big drop off because there would be, but I think, you know, Washington has handled losing some of guys, the guys that are on the higher part of their depth chart a little bit better than Dallas has to this point. And, you know, that's why this, this game's interesting because I think now, you know, for the most part, both teams have got all their, their key pieces back. And, um, you know, I just think, you know, for Washington, you do want to slow the game down. You want to make it, you know, a physical, you know, you know, just rotten, you know, punch in your mouth kind of football game. Yeah, and the only thing more consistent than than taxes is Terry McLaurin. But somehow, uh, Antonio Gibson was the most targeted receiver yesterday for the Washington football team. Terry McLaurin, three receptions, 22 yards on five targets. What did Las Vegas do to kind of take Terry out? Well, I mean, look, they, they paid extra attention. I mean, you saw sometimes they're bracketing him. Um, you know, they, they did a good job there. And again, you know, they, the pass rush, you know, Heineke had, he was under duress a little bit yesterday too. I think this is the most hits he's taken since the bye week probably. Um, and, you know, and some of them he couldn't avoid. I mean, he had to get rid of it quickly. It wasn't like, you know, there's like the game before he took two sacks that were totally his fault. I mean, because he's holding right. the ball too long. But, you know, I, I think this, this in this case, he was he was trying to get rid of it. And there was just, like I said, there's no place to go. And a couple of occasions took the uh, rough of the passer, you know, uh, which was big. You know, the early in that first drive, he made a great pass to Terry, yeah. um, you know, and he just paid the price for it. On that third but, you know, down. Yeah. You know, like the thing I like yesterday, I mean, despite, like you said, McLaurin didn't have a great day. You know, I, I think Taylor, you know he did well enough yesterday but he's played better than this yeah. and i think he'd be the first one to tell you that is the fact that when they need to manufacture a drive after like a like a drought right they went you know they literally went like the first drive to like you know the first fourth, you know the fourth quarter fourth quarter finally yeah, yeah. scoring it which was the drive started in the third quarter but anyway and then of course the very last drive to get the three that they needed to win yeah. was that they could manufacture when they needed to it and they did stay on the field long enough right they were getting first downs it wasn't like a bunch of three and outs or anything like right. that they were you know eating up clock Lock and you know kind of keeping Vegas and that and you know Derek Carr and limiting his opportunities and I think that's important you know uh even though you always want to score points you know and, and do it that way sure you'd like to score you know four, you know 35 points a game but that's you know not who this team is right now so I think they've done a good job of kind of understanding what fits you know what they have best right now and you know it, it worked out well yesterday and it was good to see they could win a game without McKissick without you know without McLaurin having a big huge game but not landing you know, Collins. 
yeah, right. But you know, at the same time, they had a great game from, you know, from Antonio Gibson. And ever since he got benched in Carolina, he's been a man possessed. Absolutely man possessed. Yeah. And uh, they're in this four game win streak. Obviously, there's been a lot of guys that have stepped up. Like you just mentioned, Taylor Heineke was playing grade A football pretty much. Antonio Gibson has looked like the guy that everyone thought he was going to be coming into the season. Um, who's a guy that's caught your eye, kind of like an unsung hero type of guy that you've well, been impressed with? I tell you, one one of the guys, and I mentioned him the other day, was um, you know was obviously Danny Johnson. I mean, mm. he and it really started the Green Bay game with Danny Johnson started playing uh, for them when that was when um, Jackson was hurt for a few games, so he he got on the field then. And then of course Jackson has come back, and then you know St. Juice is out, but Danny Johnson has been really good, and they put Fuller on the outside. Kendall's been really good too, and Kendall's not getting a a whole lot of attention necessarily, but he's been really good. And William and Jackson, Jackson. Yeah. and William Jackson's been really good. I mean, I think the secondary as a whole, yeah, they had a, you know, Lockett got loose in them a couple of times again against the Seahawks, which was, you know, you know, which is what he does every week, by the way, <laughs> he yeah. literally does it every week to every team in the league. So you can't be too you know, mad at yourself about that, but you know, you know, it's going to happen, but I just think those, those kind of guys on defense offensively, I think Eric flowers has been a monster. And yesterday when he, you know, first of all, he's questionable all week. I don't think he practiced at all the previous week. Um, he comes in, he's, you know, he get, he's ready to kill somebody for touching Taylor, which was great. Protecting his quarterback. These guys really love Taylor and vice versa, which was cool. Um, you know, and like DeAndre Carter, hell, he may make the Pro Bowl as a returner, but I think he's been really huge for them because, you know, Danami Brown, you know, they really kind of force fed him early in the season. I don't think he was ready for it. And, you know, you know, McCarter has really st stepped up because, you know, he's done a lot of the things Curtis Samuel was supposed to do that he's been out with, you know, when he's been out. So he, he's, I think, been a big part of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I just kind of like, you know, there's like so many people and I feel like I'm always missing somebody. You know, the two tackles have been really good. I mean, yeah. well, I liked Lucas last year, to be honest with you. I would have been comfortable with Lucas being the starting left tackle again this year. And then, you know, they went out and got Leno. And I, Leno scared the crap out of me in the preseason. I was like, man, this guy, he's the guy the Bears cut, right? Like, I didn't think he looked that good. And now, when the lights are on, he's been he's been very good. Now he had some issues yesterday against the stud, but overall, I think he's had a really solid season. So I, I would say those are kind of the guys that, that you know jump out uh, off the top of my head from from uh, you know guys that probably don't get a whole lot of stories written about him at this point. Yeah, and then rookie John Bates. You know, uh, not uh, people were getting on this coaching staff in this front office with that draft pick because they were saying we went we're not seeing anything out of him when yep. Logan was out. Ricky Stills Jones was in there doing was doing a really good job. But my whole thing is, I think Pete Hainer is just very, very good at coaching. And he's gotten all these guys to play at a very high level. A lot like John Matsko, that offensive line at center. How good is John Bates right now? And did you really think that he could be producing like he is right now? Well, no, I didn't. Because uh, I because he barely caught the ball in college, right? right? But I do know that the kid had a lot of confidence because, um, you know, Ron Rivera, I guess, had asked him. He said, why didn't you catch you know, more passes in college because they didn't throw it to me. That's why. And, and like, you, you know, and you know, bottom line, and you know, when they throw him the ball, usually good things happen. I mean, he's got good hands. Um, I was working with Logan Thomas yet or Logan Thomas, Logan Paulson yesterday. And Logan said, Hey, I watch this stuff because this is my old job, right? He's a blocking tight end and he's really good at that too. And he's, he's been impressed with him. So I'm happy to hear that as well. So that that's good news. I mean, cause you know, they need tight end depth. I mean, you always need tight ends. I mean, you see it all the time in this league, guys get hurt. And, you know, like you just, if you can have more than one, it's huge. I mean, look, Tom Brady's made a killing throwing the ball to the tight end over the years. So I, I'm glad to see that he looks like he could be a player. We still haven't seen, you know, Samus race on offense, but everybody really likes his work ethic and what he's doing, you know, you know, on special teams and he can block as well. I mean, he's out there blocking too. So that that's, that's good to see. And, you know, hopefully Seals Jones can come back because I thought he was playing pretty darn well prior to, uh, you know, the hip yeah. injury. And obviously then Logan came back. So it was kind of decent timing for, for all that to go down. But, yeah, I think Bates has been a find. I think Milton has been pretty good when he's gotten opportunities. I think overall the draft class, is, you know, it's it's been pretty good. And, and again, this is this roster, as we've seen, because the depth has been stretched. Four centers, four kickers, you know. Right. I mean, this ridiculous stuff has happened this year. But they have shown it is a deep roster. They've been able to handle all that stuff. Now, what can you question is, like, maybe the depth chart was screwed up in the beginning in some cases, right? Yeah. Like, maybe there's some guys that should have been playing earlier. But nonetheless, I, I think it, it is one of the better – we thought it was going to be the best roster they've had in a long time, and I think it's proven to be that uh, so far. And, you know, again, like I said, I don't want to see a stretch anymore. It would be nice to actually get people back as opposed to the other way around. Yeah, 100%. And uh, going back to about a month ago, 
uh, a lot of the fan, well, majority of the fan base was doom and gloom. They had their, oh, yeah. their torches and their pitchfork, pitchforks out. Yes, oh, I've dealt with to, all of it. <laughs> yeah, they're ready to get rid of everybody, start brand new again. And here we are a couple weeks later, 6-6, six and six, 500, going down the stretch, pretty much controlling our own destiny. How impressive have you been with this uh, coaching staff, Rivera, and the guys like that? Well, you look, I, I knew this even when all this crap was going on, I had, and I took all the dumb calls. I mean, I had retirement ceremonies in the air after the Chiefs game and all this other stuff. I mean, the low of the low was after the Chiefs game because it was yeah. the Sean Taylor uh, yeah. ceremony that was obviously a debacle. I mean, the teams admitted they blew it. I mean, so I'm not, you know, speaking out of turn here. But, you know, there was all that. So um, going on, and everybody was just so doom and gloom. You're right. And I was just like, give me a break. You're not, you're not firing Ron Rivera. You're not firing <laughs> Jack Del Riz. This is stupid. You're not going to do that because who the hell is going to come here if you fire credible football people, right? right exactly. you, you, nobody's going to – and nobody was thinking that anyway. But but anyway, it's just – it kind of got me crazy. Look, th- I knew this. No matter what was going on, the one good thing is we weren't hearing any of like, you know, it's your fault, it's your fault, you know, whatever. I mean, it wasn't coming out from the team, right? It was – there wasn't any of that stuff going on. They, they stayed together. They believe in Rivera. And the one thing I, I, I really appreciated last year – you know, during the COVID season was how much they, they, you know, rallied around their coach when he was going through the cancer treatments and everything. And yeah. and this year, his voice is so much louder and so much stronger. I don't know if you guys pick up on I mean, I, I hear oh, yeah. in our post-game interviews when we have him on, on the phone, he's just got so much more energy about him and intensity. And it's that old Chicago bear linebacker guy, you know, that you remember, uh, you know, so it's, it's really cool to see him because he's feeling better. And, and, you know, he's, he's a, he's a leader, man. And, you know, that's what this franchise has been lacking for so long on that, in that position as a coach. And, you know, Shanahan had it for a few minutes and then lost it. And, you know, then got all worried about his legacy and his kid's legacy and all this other crap that didn't matter to everybody else here. But, you know, I mean, Ron really for the first, I mean, really since Joe, you know, 2.0 has really like been like the adult in the room, you know, this guy's yeah. about the right stuff for football. It's all about football. It's another BS doesn't matter to him. And he's brought in a good staff, real professional coaches. I mean, they, they grinded. And again, I'm sure they had some tough conversations during the bye week amongst each other about what we got to do better. And, and they've come out, you know, the better for it. And I'm, I'm happy to see it. Cause I mean, there's, look, there's talent here. I think we all can see that, right. It just wasn't performing at the level and, uh, that they were that they should have been uh, prior to the bye week, and right. you know now they are. So I hope they can uh, keep it going. I mean, it's look, it's laid out perfectly for them. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better setup. You're six and six. You're actually in the playoff picture right now as a wild card. Six and you got five division games, two head to head with the team you trailed two games by. So I mean, you really, if you win this game this weekend, all of a sudden all the pressure in the world is in Dallas. I mean, like it's yeah. like, oh my God, you can't blow this because. A few weeks ago, we were all talking about you guys being the one seed and right. you, know, you could beat Tampa because you played them so well in week one, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden you're like, no, you're the team that's thrown all over, thrown up all over yourselves and uh, <laughs> choking this thing out, which we've seen happen before. Down right. there. I mean, it wouldn't be a new story if that happened. I mean, it happens often. And Mike McCarthy has been part of some choking dog teams. So, I mean, despite, you know, the one Super Bowl, I mean, we've seen that too. So time is time is a flat circle, Mr. Jackson, but I, right. I look, I watch like every single press conference and I remember last yeah. season coach Rivera sitting there spitting after every question, yeah. taking the deep breaths yeah. and everything. He was struggling. And to your point, yes, it's no. completely different to this season. Now to wrap this up, Mr. Jackson, it's yep. Dallas week to your point. You were just talking about it. What is your, what is your favorite Dallas memory, Dallas week memory? And then do you think that the yeah. rivalry is coming back with this matchup? I, I look, I think it's important. I think Ron Rivera, like he's so in tune with all this, all the things, right. That are important to the franchise since he got here. I mean, nobody did their homework better coming into the job. He didn't call the culprits by the wrong name or anything like right. Jim Zorn or somebody, you know what I mean? I mean, <laughs> he, like, he just, he cared. He knew it hip wasn't hip like, fake. yeah, he wasn't faking it. Right. So anyway, look, he, he knows what's important, but for me, like as growing up in this area, as a kid, I mean, nothing beats the 83 championship game. When Dexter Manley knocks out Danny White, Gary Hogelboom comes in, you know, and that's obviously the first Super Bowl they get to with that win. You beat Dallas, RFK is literally shaking, um, you know, it bef- the week before yelling, we want Dallas. I mean, that's just like that, you know, still watch those YouTube videos, you know, and they yeah. look so damn grainy now, makes me feel so old. And, <laughs> and it just, the, the, the hair on your neck st- stands up, you know, to, to watch it. But like, those are great. I mean, there were some other, I mean, like just even like really like insignificant games that happened over the years. Mm. 
um, like the Colt McCoy win down there. Like it made yeah. no sense. The team sucked, but that just kind of shows you where the rivalry was in Dallas. Look, they got this team a million times, this franchise, yeah. you know, a million times when they were terrible. And you're like, Oh God, how did that, how did you lose that crappy? Like the one in 15 Cowboys that, right. that beat, uh, you know, really, you know, solid Washington team that year. That was, I was in college. Oh, it was awful. These Cowboy fans in my dorm. I was so annoyed, but anyway, that was terrible. Um, look, the RG three game on Thanksgiving is still, awesome and you know the the game and the game that cleaned out that year the, in 2012 on the sunday night when they just ran it down their throat and romo oh, of course yeah. kept throwing interceptions yeah. rob jackson rob had a jackson game. yeah rob jackson yeah. was such a solid dude yeah and uh you know those kind of those kinds of like this somewhat more recently and you know i mean th th those just uh were great and, you know like last year and i get it it wasn't the real cowboys you know they had all these but it still felt great to see their kick their ass on thanksgiving oh my I mean, because goodness it's been so many crappy thanksgivings over my lifetime watching you know watching him play dallas so that was that, that was very satisfying even though it wasn't the full cowboys dude for how many years have they've talked crap about how they come here they beat us they've been controlling it ever since mm -hmm. i do not feel bad of antonio gibson giving those deuces up that was oh, well good. deserved <laughs> i loved it Scott, I can't thank you enough for joining us again, sir. You were phenomenal. I can't thank, thank you, you. Before you get out of here, if you want to plug your uh, social media stuff, just in case anybody watching does not follow you and would like to. You got it. Uh, thanks, Colin. Mike. Um, at Jackson Sports on Twitter and, you know, all of our post-game shows after the games are on YouTube, watching YouTube. Usually they go an hour. Yesterday they, they took us the full two-plus. Uh, we had Logan Paulson and uh, Pierre Garcon in yesterday. Because Smoot was in Vegas, which is probably the most dangerous thing that has ever happened. <laughs> and um, I, I, haven't, I, I don't know. I still haven't heard from him, so I'm assuming he made it back. Uh, hopefully, he'll be at the game on Sunday. I heard the house uh, from here. Yeah, and hopefully, we'll be uh, <laughs> together on Sunday from FedEx Field. And I'm hoping there's a lot of burgundy and gold, guys. I, I just Me too. I can't stand that blue and that gray and that mm. crappy-ass star. I don't need to see that crap. I, I would expect that there's going to be a lot of Washington fans there. Scott, I can't thank you enough, sir. I hope you have a great night. Thank Enjoy you guys. this victory Monday because we're about to hit Always. Dallas week, sir. Beautiful. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate have a good it. night, brother. Yep, have a good one. Take man. care. All right, everybody. We just talked to the man, Scott Jackson. Dude, his voice is crisp. He has like the perfect like announcer like yeah. radio like like play by play caller like voice is crazy. Yeah, dude. Like I want him at my funeral. I want him saying like like talking <laughs> right. me up and everything. That'd be awesome. But let's move on to our fan questions. Our next one is from our guy Aki G. He has a couple here for us, and let's do rapid fire here because we have actually have a lot of fan questions here, Hall. And this one is outside to getting the win in Las Vegas. What else were you excited about in this game? Uh. So I'll tell you, excited it. No, so you can go ahead first. So I'll tell you right now, it was the fact that they were able because I we talked about it on Friday. I was worried about them limiting the passing game. I thought the yeah. big plays were going to be a thorn in their backside, and they were. But it wasn't to the point that I thought it was going to be the backbreaking kind of this is it kind of game. And uh, that was something that I was really excited about because it's a huge weakness of theirs. Everyone knows it that you can hit this team deep, you could pass on them, and they went into that game and they said nope. We are going to make it – we're going to strangle you to death. We're going to suffocate you to the point where your best deep ball is going to be with 30 seconds left in the game, 15 seconds left in the game. Yeah, uh, that's a good one. Um, I was impressed mostly with just the grit that the team had. I mean, going back to the teams in the past years, I wouldn't say probably last year, but all the other teams under the different coaches that we had over these past couple of years, we would have easily lost that game. That was one of those games where, like, Come middle of the third quarter, it would have been a, a back-breaking deep play like you just called. Yeah. And uh, that would have been it. That would have been a wrap. Or losing a guy like Logan Thomas, that would have been the end of the offense. That would have been a wrap. There would have been no more points on the board. We would have been stifled on offense the rest of the day. So just the grit, the, the, amount, the amount of grit this team has and just the amount of, uh, amount of focus that they keep throughout the game. And just they never let themselves get too high, never let themselves get too low. They just stay kind of like Ron Rivera, just even keel throughout the game. And, and I was really impressed with that. Yeah, dude, I, I thought that because, like, when you look at this four-game stretch, like, yes, Tom Brady was one thing you could say, but then people are going to say, well, Cam Newton is a bad quarterback. Russell Wilson's coming off his injury. Limiting this Raiders offense to 15 points through four quarters, there's a lot to be said with that. And it wasn't like they dominated the time of possession like they have in weeks past with, like, 40. You know, it was 33. It was much more balanced. But they were able to keep that pass attack limited to an extent to the point where they were able to get in a position to win the football game. Absolutely loved it. I love this team so much, dude. To see where they've grown into with all the yeah. fights that we got into the first half of the season oh, and just telling people to chill out, calm down. It's Twitter, gonna Twitter was not a fun place. No, it wasn't. But you know what? To see this team here and where they're at, man, it's just 
I can't tell you how, how happy I am to watch this team get these victories, dude, because, dude, it is so freaking sweet. Now, the next question from Aki G. Hall is, this is top of the morning to you, big dog. What's up, Aki? He says, with Logan probably done for the year, how much is how much does this actually hurt the offense? And hypothetically, what free agent would you want them to bring in next year to the tight end position? Sorry about that. Um, yeah, as far as um, it hurting the offense, well, if you really think about it, they've been without Logan Thomas in the offense since uh, the Atlanta game in week three, four, whatever that was, five. So he's been out for a while now, and obviously him coming back, you saw the effect that it has on the offense, especially in the red zone. I mean, came down the field, first drive of the game, red zone, bam, Logan Thomas touchdown. So it's definitely going to be missing the red zone. I definitely think that uh, that is going to be the biggest part that it hurts this team. But like we just talked about before, I have faith that John Bates can step in. And if he's not really catching – obviously he's not going to catch passes like Logan Thomas. He's not going to stretch the field like Logan Thomas. But I get, I have faith that he can come in and kind of play that that uh, move the chains kind of like possession type of tight end role. And like, like we said before, he's yeah. a, 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 a grade A blocker in the run game, yeah, yes. which that's been our our uh, our strength over the past couple of weeks. So I have faith that John Bates can step in and do his thing. It is a big loss, especially in the red zone. You saw in that touchdown catch, that one-hander. This shouldn't have even been caught most – most tight ends wouldn't even be able to get a hand on that. And the yeah, fact that Logan couldn't catch that with one hand and bring it down and get two feet in is absolutely amazing. Logan Thomas is essential to this offense, especially given the fact that he does make it easier for guys like John Bates and Ricky Seals-Jones to be able to find those holes in the zones. Remember that one, I think, 20-yard John Bates catch that he had? Uh, Logan Thomas was on the field as well, and he was blocking, and he was actually the uh, the – decoy on that play and Bates was able to get free off of it and that's where it kind of really helps with Logan Thomas but I would expect Ricky Seals Jones to come back and do well I trust Pete Hainer in this offense now in regards to the free agent I would say no I would say let's get a draft pick in there because you already know with Pete Hainer that Samus Reyes can progress with his athletic ability being off the charts with the Raz score being a perfect 10 you know that he can be a great tight end let him groom and he could be your third tight end then have Ricky Seals Jones or uh, John Bates be your second and bring back Ricky. That's my whole thing. Bring back Ricky. With the, he's very cheap. Ricky. He does does well for this team. Ricky! And he does well for them. I, I w- I'm all about keeping Ricky here. Now, thank you, Aki. Our next question, Jeff Miles from the Discord chat server. Thank you, Jeff. Considering all the injuries, Hall, and where we fought back from, is this season officially no longer a failed season, regardless of the outcome? Um... I wouldn't say regardless of the outcome because I feel like for it to be a a uh, a better season than last year, you got to have more wins than last year. We had seven wins last year. Obviously, the good thing is we have five games to go. We're already at six wins. We had seven wins total out of 16 games last year. So I definitely think that uh, this year is going to be a, a, another progression step year. Again, like we just talked about a month ago, it didn't look like that. It looked like they had regressed. But I definitely think that they've taken a step and – like I said, I'm not going to say it's like definitely 100% a, a uh, what do you call it, a, uh, a failed season if they don't make the playoffs or get uh, get a wild card spot. But I will actually, you know what? I will say it's a failed season because they're in the wild card spot right now. And for them to fall out of the wild card spot would be kind of heartbreaking, especially all the fighting and battling back they did. But outside of that, I think it's been a great season. It's definitely been a step going forward. And Anytime you can win seven games in year one and go win uh, eight, nine games next year, that's definitely a, a plus thing to me. It could still be considered a failed season, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, Jeff, because I said it from the start. They have to make the playoffs. Um, we've been here for 20 years, mediocrity, toxicity, and, and losing. And I think the next 20 years is going to be filled with dominance, championships, and and happiness. And so for that, in order that to be the case, you have to continue building on what you've done. And I'm trying to build a dominant, be back to what we used to be, and to be what we can be. That is a dominant sports team, America's real team. And let's solidify that and dominate that from here on out. Let's get to the playoffs, and let's start this venture now. I'm ready to go. Anything else besides playoffs is a failure, in my opinion. That's all I feel, and I know that those guys on the team feel the same way. Let's win this thing out five straight, dude. I'm tired of losing. Now, our next question from Big is from Big Tony Shivers Hall, and he wants to know what are your what are your thoughts on Charles Leno and Eric Flowers sticking up for Heineke? He looked like Flowers is ready to fight everyone. Oh, I love that man. Look, 
anytime your linemen are going to go to bat for your quarterback, that just goes to show and prove that the quarterback has the the room as far as like everyone like leadership and like everyone wants to go to fight uh, go to battle for that guy. Everyone wants to fight for that guy. I mean, you heard John Allen's comments uh, after the game the other day that he believes he's the guy and like guys really fight for him and he really has like the pulse of the team and the pulse of the locker room. So I'm definitely uh definitely size. I'm definitely happy that they stood up for my man Heineke. And again, who doesn't want two six over six foot five, six foot six dudes over three hundred pound dudes as bodyguards? Yeah, I absolutely loved the, to see the camaraderie, to see someone stand up for Heineke. It shows the respect that they have for him. Um, and it's not it's not just for show. You know, it's not just for the cameras. That was real. That was emotional, and you saw that. I absolutely love that. The other one that I would like to see is the Logan Thomas with Yannick and Dockwe. Um, if I was coach, I would have asked coach to put me a wide receiver, put me on a motion right before the snap, and I would have went down and cracked that dude. I would have put my crown on my helmet right into his rib cage and put him on his ass and made stood over top of him, made sure he knows who did it and who it was for. Because that play to Logan, that was bull crap. I will. It was lazy, it was reckless, and he just didn't want to embrace the block. Instead of embracing the block, he just dove at his knee, and he cost Logan Thomas his season and possibly next year. But actually, it's not that bad because they just got released today. It's actually not a tear of the ACL, so it's actually not that bad, which is great. I'm glad to hear that. Still now, a horrible play, though. This still pisses me the hell off. Uh, now, like, keeping that on subject, our guy Ken Johansson. What's up, Ken? Wants to know, the, the news for Logan Thomas could be much better than anticipated, but the mistake in 2012 was bringing RG3 back sooner on a knee that was less than 100%. The Washington football team should seriously consider shutting down Logan Thomas for the rest of the season, don't you think? Um, I would probably say yeah, unless they get like whatever the MRI says come back. I don't know what the grade of it is. I don't know the extent of the injury or what the injury is per se, but I would probably guess that they're going to shut him down. I mean – Look, if Logan says, thinks he can come back and he feels he can come back and the doctors clear him to come back, then who am I to say keep him off the field? But, like, to your point, they've been – I don't want to rush him back. They rushed back Curtis Samuel, played him in a little bit too much, and you saw how that turned out. So, do I think he's going to get shut down for the rest of the season? Most likely. But would I be mad if he came back, especially if he wants to come back and feels like he's good enough to come back and healthy enough to come back? I wouldn't have a problem with it. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll see what the MRI says and then base it off of that. I wouldn't – I mean, obviously, Logan is a gamer, and if he wants to win football games, especially to get the playoffs, it's going to be hard to say no to that guy, uh, in my personal yeah. opinion. Um, now, game beers, real quick call. Who do you think deserves a game beer? Uh, Got to give it to the kicker, man, Brian Johnson. Everyone loves Coming a BJ. <laughs> How can you deny the BJ? Yeah. Um, Coming, like I said, 22 years old, baby face. The baby face assassin coming on the field, ice cold veins, sealed the win for us. Kick your feet up. You just turned 22. So I'm sure you enjoy, enjoyed a couple beers throughout your lifetime. So have another one. Um, I think it's the entire football team. I hate to be loser with this. I know it's easy to say that. But on third downs, they were 7 of 13. They were 2 for 2 in the red zone, which is one of the keys I had for this game in converting in the red zone. And Oakland is bad on third downs on defense and in the red zone. And Washington converted on those in a good rate like they were supposed to. They didn't take a step back. I love that. They deserve game beers. And on the flip side of that, Las Vegas offense, they were 2 for 8 on third down and 1 for 2 in the red zone. I think the team and Brian Johnson, special teams, Tressway, everyone, coaching staff, coordinators, Everyone deserves a game beer for that. That was a hard-fought total team win, in my personal opinion. Now, the next question for us is from Tim Towner, and he wants to know, how do you guys feel Jamin Davis played? Um, He was so-so. He had a, a, lot of, a couple missed tackles that I would have liked for him to clean up and uh, be better, a little bit better in open space. But, again, at the end of the day, you saw that dude flashing – Running all over the field, making plays. He had a great stop on that screen play. Yep. To get him off the get him off the field. I Too many missed tackles play. though. Too many missed tackles. I've still exactly. seen. He's exactly. he's still he's probably getting really excited. You know, getting happy feet, getting up there, and dude, just put your shoulder into him. Make sure run through him. Do not allow him to get anywhere. And if you need to break down, but the lack of tackles has become worrisome because if you're going to do anything, at least wrap him up. You know what I mean? Do not allow them to continue getting yardage because there was one play where he had a guy behind the line of scrimmage. He ended up getting four or five yards on the play. I think it was Josh Jacobs on like a I will uh, say, though, flat I will route. say, uh, he played, uh, I think it was 90% of the snaps this week, which has been his highest total through the whole season. So you can see that Del Rio and Rivera and the rest of his coaching staff is getting a little bit more confidence in him yeah. and letting him go out there and kind of do his thing and kind of 
learn through his mistakes. Yeah. And now Mike Puckett, our good friend, he was actually at the Vegas game. Uh, he was there. He lives in lucky, Vegas. Lucky, lucky. Yeah, lucky, lucky guy, Mike. He wants to know, how much more does Taylor Heineke have to show to prove he can be the guy, in quotations? Um, Depends what your definition of the guy is. If you're Franchise guy. Franchise guy, um, I would say if he goes down this stretch, wins all five division games, gets us to the playoffs, we finally get the monkey off our back and win a playoff game. I definitely think that you give him a two, three-year extension and you make him the guy going forward. I still say you draft a guy, let him sit behind him, learn the offense, learn the NFL game, and then maybe Taylor Heineke comes back down to earth and you got a guy waiting in the wings. But five-game stretch – if you go five and zero, four and one, get us to the playoffs, win a playoff game, I think you get to get yourself a two, three year extension. I got us. I got it. Before I crown him a franchise guy or the guy, he's got to calm down in those high pressure situations. I know that he broke out of that sack, and I know that obviously your heart is bumping. He shouldn't have even gotten out of that sack. No. But you have to be able to be chill in that moment to be able to hit Logan Thomas on that route because that was a first down that was easy. It should have just been an easy flick, but he overthrew him. And it's those type of situations where he gets very, very flustered. And I know Aaron has a lot of time under his belt, obviously. He's one of the best ever at playing quarterback. But it's that kind of mindset, that kind of chillness. Like, you got it, dude. Just calm down. It's yours. And that still, until I see that out of Taylor, where he has that bloodhound killer John Wick mentality, that's when he'll be the franchise guy for me. But right now, he still gets a little... A little too flustered for me. Next question is from Scott Harley in the UK. Oi! Oi! In your opinion, what's more likely? Division winners? Wild card playoffs? No postseason. What's more likely? Um, I'll go more likely would be wild card position. I think we put ourselves in just a slightly little bit of a hole in the beginning of the season. That what's more likely gonna... of the three? Of the three, what's more likely? Yeah, wild card. Okay. That, that makes yeah. sense. Of the yeah, just, because, just, just because, like I said, the hole that we put ourselves in, two and six, if we had been three and – was it three and five or something like that, whatever the math is, I can't think right now. But I think we'd be in a little bit better position. But I just think that – I mean, look, beating Dallas is going to go a long way this weekend, but we'll see. What's well, more likely, division winners <laughs> is Scott. The reason I say that, we are two games back. And that team that's two, we're two games back from, we're playing, and we have two games to play them. That's all I need. That's all I need right there. That's it. I, there, we're going to get it. Next question is from Paul Murphy. How do you rate the performances of our linebackers yesterday? I, he said, I thought Cole Holcomb had an awesome game, changing plays, and Jamin Davis had some impressive tackles. Yeah. Um, like we just talked about, Jamin Davis had a couple of flash plays here and there where he jumped off the screen, had a couple of great tackles, a lot more missed tackles than he would like. And then Cole Holcomb, look. My man, Mr. Mullet, Mullet man. He has played ninety-eight percent of the snaps for the entire yeah. season. Entire he played, season. He played every single snap on defense yesterday. Him and Cam Curl. So leading what, what leading has, tackler with ten and two pass deflections. And I want to say that's he's been a leading tackler in more than half of our games yeah. this year. So, look, Cole Holcomb. I know people are kind of hard on him in the, in the beginning of the year, but again, just like the rest of the defense, he's coming into his own, really carving out a nice role for himself and. I think they played very, very well. Yeah, and look, um, I, I'm not going to go too much more into it. I, I think you hit that r well. Our next question is from DJ Carp 99 Who do you start at center with Ishmael, Larson, and Wes Schweitzer getting healthy again? Getting healthy again. <laughs> um, it's a tough one because all of them can step in and play well. It's, it's Larson, probably, it's Larson for me. Larson exactly. was starting even when Wes Schweitzer was healthy and being a backup at guard just in case something happened with Sheriff. So I, I think it's Larson still. I think Ishmael actually did a very, very good job. I think he, he actually had a pancake yesterday, if I'm not mistaken. I haven't been able to w go back and watch the film yet. I was gonna, actually going to uh, record that one in particular. I remember seeing that yesterday. So he's done a very good job. But I would go back to Larson just because when we started this, it was with Larson and – I trust John Matsko to put the best guy out there. Yeah, no, I'm with you. It should be Larson, and then obviously Wes Schweitzer should come in, and he should be one of the swing guards, swing tackles, something like that. And then you just have Keith Ishmael on standby like he has been to come in and step in if need be. Yeah, and then our guest, Craig Curl, has a question for us. Coach Curl, thank uh, you, sir. Coach. Cam, with four tackles yesterday and one pass deflection, he had a very good game. He's done a great job, sir. He asks, are we nervous about the five-game gauntlet, and who are we getting back off IR? 
um, nervous for the five game gauntlet, I would say no because I feel like just like the fan base has a lot of confidence going into these division games, the team has a lot of confidence in themselves going into these division games and with the way that New York's been playing and then obviously Philly right up the road, I definitely think that we can at least win, go four and one, maybe even five and no down the stretch. But we'll come to see one game at a time. But I definitely think that uh they're really, really confident going into this little the round robin as Ron Vera called it. But as far as IR, I think that uh, hopefully I think that uh coach was saying that he hopes that Landon Collins will be able to practice come Wednesday or tomorrow, I guess today. No, we'll say Monday. Yeah, mm-hmm. come Wednesday. And uh, hopefully we'll get J.D. McKiss. I got a concussion protocol. Yeah, I'm not nervous at all, Mr. Curl. To be perfectly honest with you, sir, I'm not nervous because w- what's the worst thing that can happen? We can get a loss. That's that. Yeah, that sucks. But at the same time, what's worse than that? Not having meaningful games in December. I am happy. I am ready for this because you know what? It's fun to do the impossible. And they've won four straight. Everyone has told them they couldn't beat Tampa, even our own fan base. We can't beat Tampa. Can't we did it. They can't beat media people. They can't beat Carolina. They got Christian McCaffrey back. Can they do it? They did it. Oh, they can't do it against uh, Russell Wilson Monday Night Football. It's the curse. They did it. Let's do the impossible, man. Let's rip these five off, dude. I'm tired of all this talk. I'm ready to show the league that this is le- a legit team. And I'm you just got me and you, you got me ready to put a helmet and some pads on and go, go out there on the field, man. Now, uh, Jake Dutton, last question for us. Why this? Why since the defense has stepped up to it, seems like the offense can't put points on the – Why does it seem the defense (laughs) has to step up? It seems like the offense can't put up points on the board. Is the play calling too conservative? All right. I'm glad you reread that because I was like, am I lunching right now? Jake Jake read it. He wrote this like kind of mess. I'm trying to read it out right. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Um you can go ahead. I don't even remember what the question was. Did you don't lunch me out? Uh, basically, what he's, it's the seesaw is what he's saying. Is how oh, come oh, when yeah, the defense yeah, yeah, steps yeah, up, the ahead. offense drops off? And it just maybe it's one of those things, Jake. It's just that's just how football is, man. You can't ever really put a finger on it, you know. Just like how the Eagles a couple of years ago shouldn't have won the Super Bowl with a backup quarterback, but it just things happen, man. It just does. Hey, have you been, have you you've been a fan of this team probably for a long time, right? Have you seen this team? We can never have a complete, just great yeah. offense, great defense. It's always one of the other seesaw style. So, hey, you get what you can take, right? Yeah, absolutely. All right, Let's everybody. Get whatever it is. Thank you so much for tuning in for this episode. Thank you so much, D'Angelo Hall and Scott Jackson, for gracing us with their presence and great minds uh, insight into the Washington football team because that was great. That was a dream come true for mine. I've been watching D'Angelo Hall at Lane. I was at the stadium watching him against Maryland, you know, I had a lot of fun watching that guy in Washington and at Virginia Tech. I was happy he was brought here. I'm happy we were able to interview him because that was a dream come true. That was a that was a notch off the checklist. You know what I'm saying? No, yeah, definitely for me too. Like I said, I mean, from someone that's been watching D Hall, like you said, since V Tech, getting to the league, I was one of the I was one of the most happiest people when he came back home to the Washington. He's been balling out for us. I'm glad he's still with the organization, doing things with the organization, and again. It's my seventh cousin. How can I not like him? (laughs) And make sure you guys get to the stadium, FedEx Field. It's Dallas week, everybody. Toys for Tots. Bring your your unwrapped toys. Drop them off. It's for charity, everybody. Let's help out our community. Show up to FedEx Field. Watch some football and also help your community out. Nothing better than that. All right, everybody. I'm Kyle. I'm Hall. And Washington is the real America's team. Washington football. (laughs) Woo! Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Kyle. I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. And if you liked what you saw, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you get notified when anything new is uploaded to the channel. Also, we just launched theburgundyzone.com. You can go there and find all of our latest news, articles, and the latest episodes that are uploaded. Again, we also have the Discord chat server where all of our VIP folks are in, like Andy Burroughs, Scott Hartley, Sergio Martin is in there as well. Don't miss out on the Discord chat server. Go and check that out. Until next time, everybody, watching the football. Hey!